for coming tonight. Um, thank you also to the Office of Church Historical Society who is co-sponsoring this event. Um, so join me welcoming uh, Christine Hickens Bottom. She is a garden research historian and consultant. Uh, for over 20 years, she coordinated the coordinated historic horticulture program at Old Sturbridge Village, researching, planning, and planting the museum flower, herb, and kitchen gardens. Now retired from full-time work at OSB, she continues to work in costume part-time, most often in the garden, but to prevent garden programs for the village. Christy writes and consults on historic gardens. She presents lectures and workshops for home gardeners. Her program venues have included the Massachusetts Horticultural Society, Tower Hill Botanic Garden, the Northeast Organic Farmers Association, the Thomas Jefferson Center for Historic Plants, and local garden clubs and historical societies. Um, and she is here tonight to talk to us about the science and art. Tomato. Uh, so welcome, Christy, and I hope everyone yes. enjoys the program. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, feel free to ask me some questions as we go along. If it's something that I feel like is going to take us way away from the flow of the program, I'll I'll take it after we get through. But I'm happy to hear some questions. Or certainly, if there's anything that I bring up that you don't understand, be sure and ask me a question so I can stop and clarify it. So we're going to talk about both the science and the art of the tomato, uh, because I believe, and I'm not the only one, I've heard this from a lot of other gardeners, that gardening is part science and part art. And we all have to kind of abide by the science because that's the framework that we work within. But the art allows us to express ourselves and to have different theories about how things are done. So I'm going to be combining some of these two aspects as we talk about tomato culture. So the Tomato is the second most common eaten vegetable in the world after the potato, and it's the mo favorite American home garden vegetable. It wasn't always that way. In the period that I researched at Old Sturbridge Village, uh, the early 1800s, uh, up to about 1840 or so, by 1840, the tomato was introduced and getting to be fairly well known, but it certainly wasn't the most popular vegetable. It was its difficulty in cultivation, particularly here in New England, was one of the things that really slowed it down. You'll hear a lot of stories about people thinking it was poisonous, and there were some people who thought it was unhealthy, but it's not easy to grow if you live in a typical 19th century household and have to try and find a way to start plants indoors six to eight weeks before they can safely move out into the garden, which will be coming up around the end of this month. So that kept tomatoes kind of low on the horizon for people for quite a, a period of time. But when they did take off in the early 20th century, they really took off. And today, we now have incredible numbers of tomatoes available to us, all different sizes of fruits, a wide range of colors of fruits, tomatoes that have been bred and selected for different purposes. So we have salad tomatoes, fresh eating snack tomatoes, slicing tomatoes for sandwiches, paste tomatoes for cooking and canning, a whole host of different choices for us. And so certainly that's probably what motivates most of you to want to be able to grow them. So we're first going to start talking about some of the scientific aspects of the tomato. One of the things that's important to know when we think about tomatoes is that the tomato is a vine as it grows. It doesn't twine and twist like bean vines, for example, and it doesn't have tendrils on it like pea vines do, but it's still technically considered a vine. And tomatoes are divided into two types. There are the indeterminate tomatoes, which are on the left here, and the determinate tomatoes. And I when I first heard the difference between determinate and indeterminate tomatoes, I had to, as I often do, find some kind of catch that would enable me to remember which is which. So for me, the determinate tomato is determined. It knows how big it's going to get, and that's it. It's very determined. So a determined tomato is a shorter um, type of plant. It's a bush, bushy type of plant. The fruits on it will ripen earlier, and it tends to produce a large number of blossoms and then fruits that will ripen all at about the same time. It will give a high yield, in other words, at once, but then it sort of tapers off and ends its production, and it will be shorter lived and yielding than many of the indeterminate types. But because it's a smaller size, 
it's a much better type of tomato plant if what you're trying to do is to grow them in a container and it will need less support because it's not going to be as big and floppy as the indeterminate tomato. The indeterminate tomato, and most tomatoes fall into this category, I, th I think of that as just not very determined at all. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not sure when it should stop getting bigger, and so it keeps getting larger. And as you can see from the image on the left here, Flower clusters will form over time in succession as this plant gets bigger and bigger and begin ripening their fruit. So unlike the determinate tomato, the indeterminate tomato is ripening a smaller quantity of fruit at once, but it just keeps ripening successively as it grows. And it will continue getting taller all season long until cold weather in the fall kills the plant. It may bear over a longer period of time than the determinate tomato, uh, but it will bear less at any one time. And these plants are, can get very large and are going to need some kind of support. So we'll talk about that later on. That makes them not very suitable to try and grow in a container. So when we're going to choose a tomato plant, apart from trying to decide whether we want the big, rangy type or the compact type, or maybe some of both, some things to keep in mind when you're choosing tomato plants. First of all, choose locally grown plants. This could be your own seedlings, things that you start from seed yourself, or seedlings that started by growers in a local nursery. And the reason for this is that this, the this will offer you a good selection. The best selection can come from growing your own because a seed catalog is going to include more varieties than you're going to find in any local greenhouse. So you have a lot of selection. It's the best way to avoid certain diseases. And we're going to talk a little bit about that a little later on. And it's a good way to obtain varieties that are suited to the New England climate. If they're grown by local growers, these local growers have selected varieties that succeed well for them in conditions that are similar to the conditions you're going to have in your home garden. So they've already kind of weeded out or rejected varieties that don't do well in this area for whatever reason. For whatever reason. Look for disease resistance. Um, again, we'll be talking in a few minutes about various different tomato diseases. Tomatoes have been bred as more diseases have become a problem for us. They have been bred and selected for um, genetic resistance to disease. And many times some of the older varieties of tomatoes get accused of not having disease resistance. And this can be true. Uh, they are varieties that didn't need resistance because at the time they came into existence, some of the diseases that we deal with now weren't around. But there are, I can speak from experience, many heirloom varieties of tomatoes that are disease resistant. We grow a really old tomato at Old Sturbridge Village that's called simply the large red tomato, uh, back when you didn't have to have sophisticated names because there weren't a lot of different kinds. And we grow the yellow pear tomato. We grow them cheek by jowl in one of our gardens. And when, um, some of the early diseases begin to show up. They show up on that yellow pear tomato and will wipe that variety right out. And growing right next to it, where it could easily be contaminated, the large red tomato will continue to grow and fruit much longer, uh, both of them heirloom varieties. So uh, some of the newer varieties that have certainly been bred by uh, modern breeding methods to be more resistant to disease it's certainly well worth looking at them. But I wouldn't rule out the heirloom varieties flat just because of that, because many of them either are resistant or with the proper kinds of plant culture, you can grow them fine without having to worry about the diseases. And for most households, five to seven tomato plants will give you what you need for your fresh eating needs. It's nice to have a couple different varieties within your selection but they'll produce enough, so you really don't need more than that unless you're planning to do a lot of canning or something. When you're looking for a tomato to purchase, you want to take a look at the um, plants in your local nursery 
and look at the roots. So what you're going to do is you're going to, I've uh, got a couple examples with me here, I'm talking about the importance of root development. These are some tomatoes that I um, cultivated at home from seed. And I'm going to be pointing out in a little bit the importance of giving tomatoes roots plenty of room to grow and how that will enable a much healthier plant. And I've got these little guys in this six pack right here. And then I've got these bigger ones in the larger four inch pots. All of these plants are exactly the same age. Mm. Exactly the same age. These two were planted on the very same day as these were. The difference is these got moved up into larger pots, enabling their roots to grow without becoming pot bound or root bound. And when we go to when you go to a garden center you want to look at the bottom of a pot if you see roots coming out the hole in the bottom of the pot this is a sign the plant may be root bound when a plant becomes root bound and checked by not being moved up into a larger pot that checked restriction kind of stays with it it even if you move it up later on if it has been severely checked it will not recover quickly and begin to grow on whereas if we pot them up into larger pots early on and keep moving them so that they always have room to grow, then they will keep growing on larger and larger and larger without feeling restricted or checked at all. So this is one of the things you want to think about when you're um, looking for tomato plants to purchase. Ones that have been moved up into larger pots as they grow are going to be healthier and are going to suffer less from um, the action of setting them out in your garden. You want a plant that's got a nice, thick, sturdy stem on it. You want to see dark green leaves. When you check tomato plants in a nursery, look at the bottom of the leaves. Look at the very tip growth of the plant, the tender new growth, because that is the most succulent and desirable feeding place for insects. So if there are going to be insects present on the plant, that's probably where you're going to find them. So check the plant to make sure you're not bringing home with you signs of insects or any diseases that you might find. Se severe discoloration on leaves or a lot of yellowed leaves on a plant is not a good sign. And it's best when you're buying a tomato plant. It can be really um, tempting. I know back in very early March, I was going into one of the local um, Home Depot stores to pick up some hardware and out front before, you know, this was early March, out in front of the store were these huge tomato plants with tomatoes on them already sitting outside. And, you know, resist the impulse. It could be tempting. You might think, well, I'll bring that home and I'm going to have tomatoes way before anybody else. Um, that plant has moved along much farther than it should be still growing in a pot waiting to be transplanted into its final location. And what it has done when, I, I often tell people in this uh, anthropomorphizing of plants, speaking of them as if they were human, is a teaching technique I learned from my mentor, Paul Rogers. Uh, when a plant begins to flower, and especially when it begins to ripen fruit, its whole mission then becomes the production of seed. It's got a contract with Mother Nature that it has to fulfill, and that is to make seeds so that there will be more of that kind around. So the minute the plant begins to move into that reproductive phase, making flowers and making fruit, its energy gets prioritized to that particular area. And when you take a plant that's already in flower and fruit and you try to set it into your garden and encourage it to make a root system and to get established there, its energy is not programmed to do that. And it's not going to do it as effectively. Whereas if we take a plant that hasn't started flowering or fruiting yet and we set it out into the garden, then it's going to be prioritized to grow on and make roots on a healthy plant. And that will give it the wherewithal to make good fruit later on. So this is a comparison here. 
uh, a plant that has grown in a larger container. You can see it's got a nice healthy root system. It's not overcrowded. And the plant that slipped out of the smaller container on the right, where its roots are just circled around and around and around in that small container. And it's the adjustment it's going to have to go through when it gets put into the ground is going to cause it to set back, whereas the one on the left is just going to keep right on growing on. And that's what you're looking for in a, in a tomato plant. Okay, so yep. me, would, would that be a rule of thumb for other Oh, yes. Plants? That would be a rule of thumb for anything that you're going to buy, <laughs> not just vegetables, but mm -hmm. ornamental plants, mm -hmm. herbs, anything that you're going to put out into the garden. You know, that basic um, contract with Mother Nature concept mm -hmm. of the plant is true of any plant. It's really, really true of annual plants that only have one growing season to live. The pressure is really on with them to produce seeds because they know they only have one growing season to do it. A biennial that has two years to live is going to wait until its second year to do that. And a perennial may hold off for the first um, couple of years and not do a lot of flowering and, and fruiting early on. But any plant that has been have had this compacted roots or is already in heavy flowering and fruit and if your goal is to get it established in your garden with good root system it's not going to be able to do that as effectively. So growing tomatoes a species pie. <laughs> so I don't want to make it sound like tomatoes are difficult to grow actually they're pretty easy when you consider the fact that it's probably the one vegetable that almost everybody who has a backyard grows. And the vast majority of people are happy with the tomatoes they can produce. So it's not like it's an ultra sophisticated thing to grow. So if you're going to be starting tomato seeds indoors, and it's a little bit late this year to do that um, successfully, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just to uh, explain a little bit about that. Since the tomato is native to South America and is a tropical plant by nature, it's very tender. And so it's going to take it six to eight weeks of growing indoors in a protected setting uh, before we can set it safely outside. And um, we're looking at the setting it outside um, after the danger of any kind of frost and when the nighttime temperatures are warm enough for it to feel comfortable. And that's basically over 50 degrees. So if you're starting seedlings, we want to, um, again, keep them moving up into larger and larger pots. And basically what we do is as soon as they show us two true leaves, the seed leaves are the first that emerge. And you can still see them on the tomato plants I have over here. The very bottom leaves were the leaves that were actually in the seed. And they come up and emerge first when the seed germinates. And then the true leaves, which are the ones that are the shape that all the uh, coming leaves are going to have on that plant. When we've got a couple sets of those true leaves, um, we can move them up. Or for me, it's sometimes it's even the first set of true leaves if they're growing in a small six-pack cell. And I'll move them on to keep them growing well. And when we do that, we want to lift them carefully handling them by the leaves, not grabbing them by the stem. You don't want to uh, choke your little plant. It's only got one stem. It can make new leaves, but it can't make a new stem if we damage that. Uh, trying to keep the root ball intact so we don't uh, disturb the roots too much and set it back. And then when we plant it in a pot, or when we get ready to put it in the ground as well, as I'll mention later, we can set it in deeper than it was growing new roots will grow along the buried section of stem of a tomato plant. This is not true of every single plant, so you want to check other things that you're transplanting and, and to determine if this is true. With tomato plants, you definitely can set it deeper than, you, than it was growing. And if you've ever looked closely at a tomato plant, you may have seen the little bumps that you see on the outside of the stem of a plant as it grows. These are capable, these little bumpy nodes on the surface of the stem are capable of making new roots. So you end up with a bigger, more substantial root ball when you do this. Oh, excuse me, just for a second. Now, all varieties of tomatoes have just one stem? 
And what they're going to do, we're going to talk about suckers. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk about suckers. So when we when we germinate a seedling, it's going to produce a main a single main stem to start with. So that's what I'm talking about burying deeper is that stem, that okay. main stem. But we will be looking at suckering that will I thought produce. you were talking about my relatives for a second. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then at this season of the year, if you have tomatoes growing indoors, as I do, um, what we're going to be doing at this time of the year is a process called hardening them off, which means adjusting them for the move from the inside to the outside um, into the garden. And we think immediately of having to get them used to cooler temperatures than they might have indoors, but we also have to get them used to brighter light even if you have them growing under strong uh, fluorescent or um, other lighting devices inside, that none of that is as strong as the sunlight uh, when they go outside. Or, and the sun on a sunny windowsill is nowhere near as strong as the bright sunlight that they're going to get outside. Also, they have not been subjected to breezes indoors unless you have turned a little fan on to give them a little bit of a breeze. And they will make cell walls, plants will make cell walls that are suited to the environment that they grow in. So when a plant is growing in an environment where it's not being disturbed by breeze much, it doesn't really need to make a very strong cell wall. And when it first goes out, it may be kind of wimpy, and some wind could cause damage. So we harden them off by gradually exposing them to full sun and moving air, putting them outdoors into a sheltered location, in the shade to begin with, gradually moving them out into a more open setting with full sun and more air moving, and bringing them in at night. Then finally, when night temperatures are staying 50 degrees or higher, we can leave them out at night. And I found, uh, fortunately, somebody gave me as a Christmas gift a digital high-low thermometer that is one of the most valuable tools I have as a gardener because when I get up in the morning, I can consult that little digital thermometer and it will tell me the lowest temperature that's been in the last 12 hours. So I know how low it was overnight. It's amazing how you can misjudge that as a human being who comes indoors, say, by eight o'clock or so in the evening, um, and you know maybe you've had a day that day when you were out in your t-shirt and your shorts because the temperatures as we've been having recently have sometimes gone up in close to 80 and you have a tendency to think that means the nighttime temperatures are staying really warm and it doesn't always you can get some low drops we've been having temperatures in the 40s for the last couple of weeks so uh, it's not quite warm enough yet for our tomatoes to move outdoors night temperatures another thing i learned fairly recently is how important that is, you know, I think we, for a long time as gardeners, we tended to focus on the daytime temperature for our plants. And when I learned that plants actually do their growing at night, they use the sunlight during the day and to, um, to power their photosynthesis process using uh, moisture and taking the minerals um, from the soil and using the power of the sun to photosynthesize, converting those various minerals into food, the only thing on earth that can actually do that. And try and tell school kids when they come to the gardens that we need to have a lot more respect for plants because they're the only things that can make food. And they've been capturing sun energy now for uh, a long, long time, and they're still learning how to do that. And then at night, the um, carbohydrates the plant has manufactured during the day can get converted into sugars when the plant isn't working at actually making food and the plant will grow at night. Since all of these things are chemical processes and since temperatures are very critical for different chemical processes, nighttime temperature is just as critical for, particular, for each individual kind of plant as daytime. So it's good to pay attention to that. If we set our plants out when the temperatures are below 50 degrees, they may not die if they don't experience frost, but it will set them back. It will um, cause them to take a check in their growth. They halt because the conditions aren't really right for growing. And then even when the temperatures do resume the proper level, it's gonna take them a while to recover. And the plant that didn't go through that check is going to 
um, be doing much better than the ones that did. So in the garden, to have the most successful and the healthiest tomato plants, we want to grow the strongest ones. And so these are some things that are going to be important. We want a garden site that is very sunny, at least six hours, better eight hours of sunlight during the day where you put your tomato plants. We also want an area that gets good air circulation, not an area that stays where the air stays damp. And we'll be talking later about various kinds of diseases that are critical for tomatoes. And most of them are diseases that do really well when the foliage of the tomato plant stays wet for long periods of time. And so by choosing a location where there's good air circulation and sun, what we can do is we can reduce the amount of time that tomato plants will stay wet, even if we've had a rainstorm that we have no control over. We want a well-drained, rich soil with organic materials, but not fresh manures. Fresh manures are going to provide a lot of nitrogen. That's great if you're a lettuce plant and you want your lettuce plant to make tons of leaves. You really want green leaves. Nitrogen encourages that. A tomato plant is going to need some nitrogen, but if we give it too much, what will happen is it will make this huge tomato plant and it will delay flowering and fruiting. It will use all that nitrogen to keep making leaves and stems and that will mean that it won't fruit as early. We also want to avoid, if we can, this is tough sometimes for home gardeners because we often don't have a very big area to work with. We want to try and avoid planting our tomato plants in a spot where tomatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes plants, peppers, Tomatoes and all their cousins have grown in the last three years. This would be the ideal, would be to avoid planting them there. And the reason is that a lot of these tomato diseases also can build up in the soil. And if we plant tomato plants or their relatives repeatedly in the same soil year after year, we won't run the risk of developing a population of diseases in that soil which will mean that the next group of plants is going to be much more likely to suffer from those diseases. But it can be difficult for the home gardener to do this. Um, if you don't have a lot of space and you grow in containers, obviously if you're growing determinant plants in containers, you can completely renew the soil in that container every year. And so you can really reduce the incidence of soil borne diseases. As I mentioned earlier, um, talking about repotting tomato plants, when we put them outdoors in the ground, we can also set them deeper than they were growing in order to encourage more root growth along the stem. What that does is that means that the roots of your tomato plant will occupy a deeper range of soil. They'll be less susceptible to drying out than they would be if the roots were all contained in the top, say, three or four inches of your garden soil. By placing them deeper, we've got some roots that are down deeper and will have access to water more consistently than some of the shallower roots. I make cutworm collars, these little rings that you see around the base of the transplants here. I make them out of cereal boxes. This has worked really well for me for a number of years. Um, the cardboard and cereal boxes, it's got that kind of waxy coating on the outside and so it holds up for a long time. So I can just cut open a cereal box and cut strips the full width of the cereal box that are, oh, maybe about three inches wide, and then wrap them around my tomato plant in the ground and just push them down into the soil. What this will do is it will um, prevent, as one 19th century source said, you're building a little fortress around your plants. Uh, the cutworm lives in the soil, comes out at night, and walks across the surface of the soil and chews its way through the stems of its favorite plants. So if you come out and you put some seedlings and the, the cutworm seems to be much more attracted to transplants than it is, sometimes they'll eat things that come up from direct seed, but they're much more likely to come after transplanted things. And if you come out in the morning and your transplants look like somebody came with a little chainsaw, cut them off and they're just sort of locked onto the ground, it's probably a cutworm. And if you dig in the soil around the base of a plant that you find that way in the morning, you can often find this grub-like cutworm that's down there. 
if we put these little cardboard fences around, the cutworm will not climb over them. This will form a barrier that will protect susceptible plants. How far down do you have to uh, you don't have to put it down very far. The worm's going to crawl across the surface of the soil to get after the plant. So as long as it's pushed in deep enough to anchor it firmly. So I would say, you know, I'd probably push them down maybe a half an inch into the soil at the most. It doesn't take very much. Uh, and then eventually we're going to want to mulch, uh, apply a mulch to the surface of the soil. Uh, we're going to want mulch there for all the reasons you may be familiar with mulch to prevent the evaporation of moisture from our soil so that the soil stays moist um, consistently and doesn't dry out quickly from the effect of the sun and the breezes. Mulch to cut down on the germination of weed seeds so we don't have as much weed competition for our plants. Um, but we don't want to mulch the soil of our tomato plants until the soil has warmed up. The soil may still be relatively cool when the plants go into the ground at the end of May. Tomato plants are going to want a nice warm soil. If we mulch it right away, what we're doing is we're insulating the soil and that will tend to hold the temperature consistent at where it is. So most advice will suggest to wait until you see some blossoms developing, the first flowers developing on the little tomato plant and then mulch because you know the tomato plant then is happy with the soil temperature and you can put the mulch on without worrying about interfering with the most desirable temperature for the plant. And then what we're going to want to do with our tomato plants is keep the soil evenly moist. And this is probably one of the most important things with raising. It's not just tomatoes, but it's especially important with tomatoes. Uh, to make sure that it doesn't go, the tomato plant doesn't go through a period of dryness and then a period of soaking wet. What we're trying to do is accomplish an evenly moist soil. If we have prepared our soil in advance with additions of things, particularly like a compost, compost is great. It will solve problems, two kinds of seemingly contradictory problems. If you have a really sandy soil, like we have over at the gardens where I work at Old Sturbridge Village, the sandy soil tends to dry out really quickly, to drain water away very quickly. Putting compost into that adds a material that is spongy, that will hold more water, prevent it from draining out of the soil. The opposite on that scale is a clay soil. And if you have a clay soil, you know that it dries out very slowly. Water doesn't move down through clay soil easily at all. And so when it gets wet, it stays soggy wet for a long time. Clay soil also can compact, and that forces the air out of the soil and makes it difficult for plant roots to grow effectively in it. If we add compost to clay soil, the compost is fluffy and light and airy, and it will open that soil up, allowing air in allowing moisture to drain better through the soil. So it may seem almost contradictory, but compost will fix the two dry problems of a sandy soil and the two wet compact problems of a clay soil. And if we have a good, well-prepared soil and we make sure that our plants get a minimum about a, an inch of water a week and not over water, then we can keep our plants evenly moist. And liquid seaweed and compost, um, I'm an organic gardener, so what I'm going to be recommending in this program will be uh, soil amendments and tr um, treatments for plants that would fall within the organic spectrum. I'm not a proselytizer, so I'm aware that people are, have, this is where some of the art comes in here. Uh, people have choices about what they want to do in their own home gardens, so, you know, please don't feel like I'm wrapping your knuckles. Um, but uh, liquid seaweed will provide, um, the nice thing about liquid feeds for plants is that they are already, the food is already dissolved in water and so it's available for the plant to eat right away. If we rely only on those liquid feeds, then the plant's going to go through periods of being really well fed when it has the liquid feed and then starving when it doesn't have any liquid feed. So we definitely want to balance that with composts and other enrichments that will be releasing slowly for the plant. What about fish emulsion? Fish emulsion? 
seaweed emulsion, fish emulsion. Yep, I, I, would, I should put either of those in there. Both okay. of them can work in the same way. Okay. What we're looking for is not a heavy amount of nitrogen, as I yeah. said earlier, but phosphorus and potassium, and both of these will provide that in <coughs> good amounts for your tomato plant. So a, 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 if you used a uh, granular, you know, you'd want to stay away from a 10, 10, 10? Yes, you would. Yeah, the first number in your fertilizer yeah. is going to be nitrogen. So you're looking for a fertilizer that has a lower nitrogen availability uh, and higher potassium phosphate. Yeah. It's not that they don't need nitrogen. They do. But if we overfeed them with nitrogen, um, the results are not going to be what you're looking for. You have this gorgeous green, um, very lush plant, but you may not get much fruit or not until very late in the season. If you have comments, Dawn, I'm happy to have so we're going to want to avoid tomato stress, and some of these things I've mentioned already. Uh, again, thinking about plants in the way we might think about ourselves and other people, I think helps us to understand. Plants do get stressed by a number of things. And stress, when we're stressed, we're more likely to get sick. When plants are stressed, they're more likely to be sick. And interestingly enough, a stressed plant is also often more appealing to insects particularly if it's drought stressed. And I never could understand that. You'd think that insects would be like us. You know, when we go shopping at a farmer's market, you pick the best looking vegetables. You would think the insects would be doing the same thing. But to them, a vegetable with a high sugar content in its system is very appealing. So when a plant is evenly watered, the sugars in it are going to be more diluted and less attractive to the insects. So water-stressed, drought-stressed plants are often the first ones that the insects will go to. So we, tomatoes can be stressed by the temperature extremes, as I've mentioned, the cold. But also, you may notice, especially now, when we're getting much higher, particularly higher night temperatures, you know, it used to be that we would get, in the midsummer, we could get days over 90 degrees but we didn't get the long, hot nights that we're getting now. And that can really have an impact on tomatoes. What you'll often notice, and that there's not much really we can do about it, unfortunately, but the signs of this will be that the tomato may abort its flowers and fruit. So if you go out into your garden and some of the little flowers that you've been observing on your plant are all of a sudden dropping off and missing, pay attention, you know, say to yourself, have we had really hot nights recently, extreme heat? And that, if, if the answer is yes, that's probably the stress factor that has caused this problem. Damage to the root system of the plant interferes with its ability to take up water and nutrients. So when we're working around our tomato plants, we want to be careful not to cultivate too deeply, to dig or hoe too deeply into the soil. This is one of the advantages of having a mulch around your plants is that it means you don't have to do that uh, and so you'll, you won't be so likely to damage the plant's root system. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, too much, we don't want soggy wet soil. If the soil is soaking wet all the time, it has all of the spaces in the soil are filled up with water and that means there's no oxygen in there. And keep in mind that plants are like we are, plant roots need oxygen. So keeping the soil of your plants soaking wet all the time is sort of like holding your head under water. Uh, the plant ha can't take a breath at all. So we need to have the moisture regulated and not too dense. And um, so then keeping a, a proper level of moisture. And then deficient nutrients, especially as I mentioned just a little bit ago, the important ones for the tomatoes growth are phosphates, potassium, and calcium. And I'm going to talk about the role played by calcium uh, in just a sec. So we'll take a look at the sort of downside of um, what we have to cope with sometimes with tomato plants. Three common tomato diseases, not always easy to distinguish one from the other if you're not a real plant doctor. 
there are some clues. Um, early blight, simply meaning that it's a form of blight that tends to arrive early in the season and impact plants. Late blight, one that tends to arrive more toward the end of the season and can become more severe because when a plant is loaded with fruit and it's giving up all of its energy to ripen that fruit, it becomes more susceptible to disease because it can't put a lot of its energy and resources into the plant tissue and so diseases can take hold more easily at the end of the season. And leaf spot. Um, and Early blight is caused by a fungus, and this fungus can overwinter, meaning it can stay alive through the winter here in New England. And it's really important, I think, if, if we don't understand, if we're not sophisticated and we can't understand a lot of detail about plant diseases, I think the most important thing to understand is how those diseases are spread, and that they are spread by spores. So a fungus produces spores. Um, very fine little material that becomes the, the um, genesis for new funguses. This fine material can blow long distances in the air, miles it can be carried in the air. And it is more likely to infect a plant if the plant is wet because the fungus, need, the fungus spore needs to have moisture for a period of time before it can really get itself attached and fixed into the plant. So the longer your plant's foliage stays wet, especially overnight, the more likely it is that it can become uh, a spot that's very um, agreeable to the spores of various funguses. Uh, eventually these funguses, they usually start on the older, lower leaves of the plant. The younger leaves of the plant are more resistant and then it will spread to the stem, the fruit, and the whole plant. The dreaded late blight is another fungus. Again, spreads in warm, damp weather. A couple of years ago, we had a real exceedingly warm, damp, early summer, and we've had a huge problem with this. The leaves will develop first these kind of blue-gray spots on them, and then you'll see this white cottony mold appear on the stems and on the leaves. And then you can see the um, fungus attack the fruit. And about the best thing to do is to remove and destroy infected plants because they're going to become vectors for the disease. Don't throw them in your compost pile or anywhere in your property. They go in a black plastic bag and out with the trash so you can get them off the property. Many people recommend sticking them in a black plastic bag and putting them out in the sun to cook it at high temperatures. Um, I don't know if that effectively will really kill the funguses. But it can overwinter on infected things like potato tubers and perennial weeds. It can overwinter on any vegetable refuse in your garden, which is one of the reasons why being a good garden housekeeper and cleaning up all the old plant material from your garden in the fall, as soon as your garden season is over. I think for a lot of people, they think when the frost kills their plants and they harvest the last of the vegetables and bring them in, then they're not going to do any garden work until spring. And Many gardens will stay over winter with the old plant stakes and dead squash vines and old tomato plants hanging out in there until somebody starts clean up early in the spring. That's not a good way to go. You want to get that old material out just as soon as possible to avoid the overwintering as much as possible of any diseased material in your garden. So these are some of the steps you can take to prevent having these funguses get established. So in 2009, and then again, I forget what year it was, was it 2014 or so? Yeah, when we had a second um, blight epidemic. And one of the sources for this blight was late blight infested tomatoes that were distributed to big box retail stores. As I mentioned, some blights can overwinter here in New England, but not all of them do. 
So for a long time, when we were using primarily tomato plants that had never lived in any other part of the world except New England, we didn't have as much of a problem with these diseases. In the south, these, in, with the warmer winters, many of these plant funguses can live through the winter in the south. So if a bunch of tomato seedlings get started in the south, they could have this fungus on them when they are shipped up, and by the time they get up here, the weather is warm enough that the fungus isn't going to be killed, and these, this large influx of disease-ridden tomato plants that came up from the south spread the disease through the, carried by the wind, so even if your tomato plants weren't acquired in that way, uh, they may have been subject to the spores that got spread so widely from these um, plants that were distributed. The weather was very um, hot and very humid. That made it um, the disease spread even more rapidly. And this is a disease that can impact not just tomatoes, but their other relatives, like potatoes, um, eggplants, and peppers. Uh, the leaf spot is also caused by a fungus, so uh, like the other fungus diseases, it's the worst in humid weather and after heavy rains. It first appears on lower leaves. The leaves will turn yellow and then they'll turn brown and then they'll fall off. So one way to try and control this disease is to remove the infected leaves when you see them, to cut them off. Since this disease is spore-borne, and the spores are on the lower leaves, many of those spores will drop off onto the soil beneath your plant. When water strikes that soil and splashes the soil up onto the lower leaves of your plant, that's going to spread the disease in the plants. So this is another reason why mulching tomato plants is a really good method, not just to retain moisture uh, and to cut down weeds, but also to prevent the spread of diseases that might be in the soil itself. If it rains hard, or if you run some kind of sprinkler or a watering system that can splash water up onto the lower leaves of your plant, you may be cycling that disease from the soil up onto the plant. A layer of mulch can form a kind of protective barrier between the soil and your plant and cut down on the spread of those soil-borne diseases. Is there any sprays that help, like the copper sulfate? Copper sulfite sprays, yes. Yep. Um, are, in fact, I don't know if I've got that. Yep. Uh, right here, your question was right on time. Um, copper fungicide sprays, um, biofungicide sprays for organic gardeners, um, two brand names. I don't know, John, do you know of others in your work? Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> copper is probably the one that is the, the most common. People use it on fruit trees for funguses too. Yeah. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of fungicides. So the more things that you can do that we've been mentioning early on to try and reduce the incidence of these diseases, the better. Blossom rot is another problem that um, tomatoes suffer from. This is a picture on the left of some tomatoes. It's called blossom end rot because the symptom, plant symptoms appear on the end of the tomato where the blossom fell off, the bottom of the tomato. Uh, it's due to a deficiency of calcium. And I think it was really only, historically speaking, relatively recently that plant scientists discovered the important role that calcium plays. We've always known about adding lime to our soil to modify the acidity uh, of soils, particularly here in New England, that tend to be naturally more acid. But we have also learned that the calcium that's in lime enables plants to build strong cell walls. And that helps to prevent plants from suffering from diseases that are an invasion of the cell wall. So. Um, with add, making sure that your plant has enough calcium is a good way to prevent blossom and rot. It can be caused by not having enough calcium in the soil itself to begin with, but if we don't have a consistent water supply, even if the calcium's there, it won't be available to the plant. Are we getting late or am I? No, oh, okay. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure. Uh, 
So we want to make sure that when we plant our tomatoes that we have sufficient calcium in the soil. If your soil has had a lot of lime and it's heavily alkaline and you don't want to change that, make it more alkaline, you can use gypsum to add the um, calcium to the soil. And that will um, uh, mess up your uh, soil pH. Um, maintaining even moisture and mulching. Again, avoiding root damage because root damage would interfere with the taking up of the calcium and the, and the moisture into the tomato plant. Uh, and feeding with fish emulsion to provide the phosphorus. Phosphorus enables plants to be more disease resistant. And so this is an important um, food, a nutrient for your plants. Can you side dress with granular lime? You can, yes, you can. Yep. Side dressing is something I think, again, when we talk about fertilizing plants, uh, for a long time, I probably fell into the habit that so many gardeners do of thinking, well, I've prepared my soil in my garden when I'm ready to plant. I put a lot of compost. I put a lot of fertilizer in when I planted my plant. Now I'm done. But we forget that that's like putting food on the buffet table. And as the plants feed and grow, they're using that up. And particularly when plants like tomatoes begin to start setting fruit, they're going to be really dependent on a, a good supply of nutrients. And so side dressing or top dressing, and what those terms mean is adding uh, nutrients by tickling them into the soil around the sides or into the top layer of soil around a plant so that those nutrients then can become dissolved as you water and feed the plant as it's growing. And so uh, I mentioned earlier that the fish emulsion, the liquid feeds are great because they, you know, if you notice the plants beginning to look kind of yellowy and you think it needs nutrition right away, this is like intravenous feeding. It adds that nutrient right away. But as soon as the, it rains or you water, it's leached right out of the soil and gone. So side dressing or top dressing with nutrients and soil amendments um, to maintain the proper levels is good because those, uh, unless some of the chemical fertilizers that we apply dissolve right away in water when we water, and so in essence they are a little bit longer life than a um, fish emulsion, a liquid feed, but not a lot. They are dissolved in water and then leached away or used up pretty quickly. The organic um, uh, soil amendments that require the action of soil microorganisms, the little living critters in the soil, to digest them before they're available for your plant to use, those are the ones that are going to have the longest life and they're going to be constantly being available as they slowly get digested. So we want to think in terms of nutrients that are balanced out to give us all the nutrition we need. Early in the season, when the soil is still really cold, those soil microorganisms are not really active. I remember Paul Rogers saying uh, they belong to a very strict union and they don't work <laughs> when it's cold. Um, and so we have to wait until the soil warms up before some of those composts and other um, rotted manures and things that need to be digested, before those are going to be available to our plants. So early in the season, more dissolvable or liquid fertilizers are important to kind of carry the plants through until the soil microorganisms begin to do their cooking and serve up their meals. And drought stress can look like a disease problem. Sometimes the kind of symptoms that we see from drought stress uh, can make us think we've got a sick plant. Again, I think some of these kinds of, for me as a gardener, trying to diagnose exactly the cause of a lot of these diseases is very challenging. Uh, but um, making sure that we keep the moisture. And tomatoes are very attractive. So there are a wide, uh, well, not a wide variety, but there are a number of insects uh, that uh, find them attractive. And probably one of the most intriguing is the uh, tomato hornworm. Um, yeah, uh, they're amazing. Uh, probably if you found them in your garden, you've probably had the same experience that I've had with them, that you 
you work on your tomato plants for weeks, all of a sudden you go out in the garden one day and the whole top of your tomato plant, this whole region of the plant, there's nothing left of the leaves except leaf stems. And you say, whoa, what is this? Uh, and then you look and you're looking like crazy to see what it is and lo and behold, right in front of you, there's this almost three inch long fat caterpillar and you didn't see him when he was tiny and just starting to eat, but there he is. Uh, it's called the hornworm because of the horn that you see. Um, fortunately, uh, if, and if you recognize the symptoms on the plant and go looking for them, usually you don't have 25 or 30 of these. It's usually only one or two or three at any one time, and you can find them and hand pick them and remove them. One year, if one year we had literally probably maybe a 15 plant tomato plant garden and every day for several weeks we would pick off three or four or five off of every single wow. plant. Wow, that's a, unbelievable. That's a really heavy infestation. Unbelievable. Yeah. But they went as fast as they showed up. They, right. If you pick them off, then they are gone pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and you want to, of course, get them before they consume so much foliage on the plant that the plant has a rough time to recover. They're very difficult to see. They are. They are. Yep. You really have to look very carefully because they blend right in with the plant. If you see one that looks like this, what's on this tomato hornworm are parasitic wasp cocoons. A parasitic wasp has laid its eggs on the tomato hornworm. If you see one of these, don't squash it, and you can put it aside on uh, another in another location so it doesn't eat up your plant. But what you want is for these to go through their life cycle and create these parasitic wasps because they are beneficial insects that um, act as a control over the populations of the tomato hornworm. So um, I've seen these numerous times in my home garden. So it's not unusual for these wasps to kind of come in and help do the job for you. So basic tomato health advice, rotate planting locations year to year as much as you can. Plant healthy plants and keep them healthy. Give plants good air circulation. And we're going to talk a little bit about spacing and support. Maintain even moisture but avoid wetting the plant foliage. So what this means when you're watering is you want to water the base of the plant, water the soil. So overhead watering with sprinklers and other such devices is not a good idea on your tomato plants. If you can use soaker hoses, drip irrigation, or a watering wand that you can control down at the base of the plant so the foliage stays dry, uh, that's the best way to go. We have no control over the natural rain and humidity, but we can control what we do with water when we're watering. Don't feed too much nitrogen and practice good garden hygiene. So, I was hoping it was going to be bigger. I'm still new to gardening. If you do all these things, you'll probably be very successful. So we're going to take a quick look at some of the art of the tomato. Um, I thought this was kind of fun. <laughs> <clears throat> so, in that art category, I see um, bringing in some heirloom varieties of tomatoes to enrich your um, uh, selection in your garden and add some history to the garden. Uh, the ones that have stood the test of time have usually done so with very good reason. Uh, they don't always produce as heavily as some of the newer hybrid varieties of tomato do. And some of them might produce a little bit later in the season, so you may not have quite such early fruit as you might from some of the hybrids. But blend some of them in. For me, uh, the day that we bring the first brandy wine or mortgage lifter or pineapple tomato to the table, it's like serving the Thanksgiving turkey. We put it on a big platter and we slice it and we have slices and we and ooh and ah over how wonderful the flavor is and it's you know really worthwhile. So we're going to talk a little bit about some pruning and control of growth. And some of this, this is really, there are a lot of different ways that you can prune your tomato plants. And we're going to talk about supporting them and pruning them. And here 
it really is kind of an art. It depends on what your choice is about how you want to grow your plants. And we'll talk about some of the different methods. Just so you know the terminology, uh, with the tomato plant, we're going to be talking about growing tip. That's the very tip, utmost growth of the kind of leading stem of your tomato plant. I'm going to talk about suckers. Suckers are future alternative stems, other stems on your plant. This is what we were talking about earlier. So a plant can produce other stems besides just that main stem. And those arise in the leaf axles, the little angle between where the leaf joins the stem of the plant. And then we can talk about flower clusters, which the plant will form, and then of course those will end up being your fruit clusters. So we want, pruning the tomatoes usually means controlling the number of large stems we're going to have on the plant. And depending on how you decide to support your plant, you may be able to leave more or you might need to remove more up from your plant in order to grow it properly. If you decide you're going to try and control your plant to a single or maybe only one or two stems, then you're going to want to remove any suckers other suckers that start to grow at the leaf axis. And the tricky thing is getting those little guys out while they're still little. Because they will, um, your, once your plants are growing, when you've got a healthy tomato plant, these things will take on size overnight. So it really is, I, for me, it's an everyday going out and looking at my plants. Because you want to remove them while they're tiny, and when you can just pinch them, as you see here, kind of wiggle them back and forth and they'll just break right off. If they become so large that doing this with your fingers would tear them or tear the plant, or where you have to cut them with a tool, you may then be opening up a wound into your plant that isn't going to heal quickly and can be a source of infection from the various kinds of diseases that we've talked about. So if you can remove them when they're tiny, those little wounds will heal over and less likely to cause you problems later on. Most um, garden advice will suggest that you, as soon as you see the first flower cluster form on your tomato plant, that you remove leaves and suckers growing below that lowest flower cu cluster. There are a couple of reasons for doing this. One is to improve air circulation, so you don't have a lot of foliage growing right down near the ground. Another is to remove that foliage that might be susceptible to being infected from soil-borne diseases. And in the case of the suckers, anything that's growing closest to the root system has got first dibs on the nutrients. It's sort of like if you're sitting at the end of the table where they put the serving plates down, you've got an advantage over anybody that's eating further up on the table. So by removing any growth that's going to compete for nutrients with that lowest flower culture cluster, that will help to accelerate the quality and the ripening of fruit on your plant. So this rule of thumb is one, again, this is art, so I'm talking about art here. You've got a freedom to make choices, do this or not. I'll explain why this is a prevailing idea for your tomato plants. And it makes, seems to make good sense to me. Um, but this is one that you'll, you'll see in most literature that you'll look at today about um, pruning tomato plants. This is a basic advice. And this is one bit of advice that's usually recommended both for indeterminate tomatoes and determinate tomatoes. The rest of the pruning that I'm going to be talking about is mostly for the indeterminate ones. One of the nice things about those determinate tomatoes, those compacted ones that just grow to a certain size, is that they don't get big and floppy and unruly, so you don't need to do a lot of pruning on those. But the indeterminate ones, we might want to control. So we want to prune while the suckers are small, but wait until the plant's about a foot or two feet tall or the first flower cluster starts to uh, form. Prune yellowed lower leaves out of the plant. plant leaves that are yellowed are not doing the plant any good. They can't photosynthesize and provide anything for the plant. They could, because they're weaker, become a source of infection. Um, so remove those, prune them out. 
Don't over prune your plant when you're pruning. If we remove too many leaves from the plant, then the fruit could be susceptible to sun scald. We want just enough leaves on our tomato plant to provide a little shade for the ripening fruit. If you get sun scald, you'll see a discoloration on the top of the fruit that actually then can become a kind of weak spot um, and diseases can get in there. Uh, prune on a dry day. Again, we don't want to spread diseases around by getting spores on our hands and then getting them stuck on the plant as we work. And you don't, as I mentioned, you don't really need to prune determinants. So a couple of ways that we prune. When we see these tiny little suckers, as I mentioned, we get rid of those while they're still tiny. Sometimes you miss one of those and it's starting to get kind of big and you don't want to rip it off and damage the plant. So this is something I only learned about recently is a type of pruning that's known as Missouri pruning. And basically what it is is pinching the tip out of that sucker. So you're not taking the whole thing off into the main stem of the plant. You're just pinching the tip out. What will happen is you're going to have to keep going back and doing that because it's going to keep trying to grow. But it's a way to keep it under control without damaging the main plant. And then when your indeterminate tomato plant has reached a, a real tall height and we're getting close to the end of the growing season, it's a good idea, many people will, prune the very tip, the top, out of that plant. What that does is it stops the plant from getting taller and taller. It stops it from using a lot of energy to get taller and taller. And it directs the plant energy back into the ripening and development of the fruit. So now the tip of the plant has a dominance. It, um, as it would make sense if you're a plant and you need to get taller than everybody else to get the best sunlight, that you would give priority to growing the tip. But if we want fruit to begin to ripen, we want the plant to put its energy toward that. So once we've got a reasonable amount of fruit set on our plant, we don't have a lot of season left to develop. Any fruit that's going to develop is probably not going to have time to ripen anyway. Prune out the tip, and that will help to force the growth back to the ripening fruit. And there are a lot of options for supporting these indeterminate tomatoes. This is an image from Fearing Burr's Field and Garden Vegetables of America in 1865, sh uh, showing a tomato hoop structure that, in its shape at least, looks a lot like some of the modern ones that they sell at the garden centers. But this one's made out of stakes and barrel hooping, um, barrel hooping material. And then on the right, a tomato trellis. Um, that uh, he says is set, uh, formed by setting common stakes four feet in length, four feet apart on a line with the plants and nailing lath board or narrow strips of deal from stake to stake about nine inches apart on the stakes and then attaching the plants afterwards by means of bass and by bass he means a, a, like a, a plant fiber twine that you can use to tie your plants onto the trellis. Uh, in the manner of grapevines or other climbing plants. I had never heard of trellising tomatoes until I started work at the village and we um, saw trellising as the common recommended method with this advice description and picture. And so I've started making a tomato trellis. We did them at the village and I really like the way that system worked. So I've started using it at home. So I actually grow my tomatoes at home with three different methods, and I do different plants on the different methods. So this is my tomato trellis. These are tomato stakes, which is a pretty traditional method of supporting tomato plants. And then just see, I'll show another picture later, but you just see the corner here of a tomato cage, a homemade tomato cage. And this is what, uh, a little harder to pick out the structures with the tomatoes all over them, but this is a tomato growing in a cage here, and tomatoes trained to stakes, and then the trellis on here, I've got a little bit of view of the trellis, um, where the plants um, can spread out over the trellis. So the advantage is with, um, with the cage, you really don't need to do a lot of pruning to your tomato plant at all. 
Um, I usually set my tomato plant in the cage with a stake to begin with, just to support that central stem as it's growing and hold it up. But then the cage itself supports the rest of the um, stems that grow from those suckers. And I might remove some of the suckers if it looked like it was getting so dense inside there that the air circulation and the sunlight penetration wasn't going to be good. I might just thin it out. And I have to steer those sucker branches because they'll aim out through the openings in the cage and I want to keep them in. So uh, every day when I'm out there looking for the pinching off little suckers on some of the others, I check that caged tomato plant and kind of steer the tips of the stems in to keep it growing inside the cage. The staked tomatoes are going to need, so here's a, a tomato cage. And personally, the ones that they sell at the garden centers, I think most of them aren't big enough to support, uh, you know, they'll fall over with most typical uh, tomato plants. They're not really large enough. And so I've done what a lot of garden sites recommend is to buy concrete reinforcing wire. Uh, for me, it took a couple people to bend that because it's pretty, wants to spring back on you. But once it gets bent and tied, then I've made a bunch of these and I just keep them tied up and they stay outdoors in the winter. They get rusty, but it doesn't seem to bother their function at all. And so I have a couple of those. What I like to grow inside these are my real small fruited tomatoes, like my sun golds, the little kind of cherry type tomatoes. I find that I, those are ones that I can grow as a kind of free form plant inside a cage and they do really well that way. And the concrete reinforcing there has openings big enough that you can reach through the holes to pick or to um, manage your plant in any way that you need to. I also, when I set these in the garden, um, I put stakes in the ground, driven down into the ground, and tie the tomato cage to them. Because if you don't, if you get a, a windy thunderstorm, uh, when you've got a full foliage plant inside, the whole thing can tip over on you. So you want to set it um, with some stakes to hold it in place. Then tying the tomatoes to stakes, for this, I sometimes I'll restrict a plant to one stem, but I want to get as much fruiting as I can. So I'll oftentimes allow a couple of stems on a stake, and then I tie them with pieces of bed sheet. So I just get an old bed sheet, and it'll last me for years. And I just cut the strip so maybe a half an inch wide, you can just make snips in the fabric and then just tear them and uh, stick a whole bunch of them in my pocket and go out into the garden. In fact, what I often will do is I'll tie my plant up and then I'll tie a bunch of those um, bits of bed sheet up on the pole so they are there. And then when I come out into the garden and notice that a shoot has started to grow and it's going to lean if I don't tie it, I've got that um, strip of bed sheet right there already, ready to go. And I tie the sheet to the pole tightly and then loop it around the developing stem to hold it in its proper position. That way it doesn't restrict the stem uh, cut into it at all. It's soft and flexible. The bed sheet easily lasts right through the summer without rotting or falling apart. And I also like to put planks on the ground between the rows of steak tomatoes, you know you're going to have to be walking in there to tend to the staking and to water and to pick your tomatoes and pick off the hornworms and everything. And by putting down a piece of plank in there, it avoids compacting the soil around the plant. So it keeps the soil under the roots. It spreads your weight out evenly and um, keeps the soil around the roots of the plants from getting heavily compacted. You can get pretty fancy with tomato trellises. I found this really neat image um, online. This shows you the tomato uh, A-frame trellis uh, with fancy finials on it and everything. Here it is there. Here's what it looks like. It's like training an espalier fruit tree. With these, you can leave a number of stems to grow and just simply train them out and tie them, spread the plant out across the trellis as it grows. And training them out on the horizontal, I find, uh, for a lot of fruiting plants, um, 
uh, scientists will tell you that when the light sunlight strikes the fruiting part of the branch at right angles, that you get heavier fruiting. Uh, that's why they train grapevines in that way. And I found my trellis to trained tomatoes to be very fruitful. So I like to use the trellis for my paste tomatoes because I'm trying to get as many fruits from those varieties ripe all at the same time to cook with them. Uh, and so I use those, I put those on my trellis. My large fruited varieties go on the steaks usually. So on the handout that I provided for you, I've added a couple of little bits of information, some, a website called tomatodirt.com, which I came across, which has extensive, extensive material on just about every aspect of tomato growing that you might like. And then also um, a, a really good comprehensive article in the Rodale Organic Life website called Tomatoes, A Growing Guide. And it's about a six or seven page article that you can print out that uh, covers all the things that I've talked about tonight and uh, a few more that I have addressed. So uh, I hope you'll be able to come up with a nice crop of tomatoes so you can uh, uh, happily, you're happily thinking of the cans of summer's goodness waiting at home to walk past the tasteless ones in the supermarket. Art and the science of the tomato. Thank you very, very much. Good. Thank you.